On a relatively mild January night in 1919, Boston was the setting for one of the more bizarre disasters to ever happen on American soil. The incident was also the impetus behind the longest core battle in the city's history. 21 people lost their lives that day, while another 150 were seriously injured. The price tag to address the damage was in the neighborhood of $100 million adjusted for inflation. To say that the accident was devastating barely begins to convey the chaos that ensued. So what happened? On Commercial Street in Boston's North End, a tank holding nearly 2.5 million gallons of molasses, the standard sweetener in the U.S. at the time, was waiting for transfer to the Purity Distilling Co.'s distillery in nearby Cambridge. The 50-foot-high tank was a well-known landmark in the neighborhood, which at the time was inhabited by mostly Italian and Irish immigrants. The area also included an elevated rail line, numerous blacksmith businesses, a slaughterhouse, and unpretentious working-class homes. The three-year-old tank had set Purity's parent company, United States Industrial Alcohol, USIA, back $30,000, about $393,000 today. Its location proved perfect for its purpose. It sat a mere 200 feet from Boston Harbor and was also close to the railroad, ensuring that the shipping of molasses in and out of the city could be done quickly and efficiently. Unfortunately, the storage tank was never properly tested before being put to use as a huge shipment of molasses was due to arrive a few days after the tank's construction was completed. From the very beginning, leaks in the structure were noted and streams of molasses would roll down the sides of the tank. On the plus side, people living nearby would fill up to-go cans with the sweet brown goo and kids would scrape molasses off the tank with sticks to create homemade lollipops. On the downside, for those living nearby, on January the 15th, 1919, right around noon, as everyone was enjoying their lunch, the tank exploded, releasing a violent 15-foot tall wave of over 2 million gallons of molasses onto the streets of the North End. The torrent of molasses was traveling at the not-so-slow-as-molasses speed of 35 miles per hour, that's 56 kilometers per hour, turning wooden structures in its path to kindling, breaking the steel girders that supported the elevated railway, and toppling electric poles in a dangerous orgy of pops and sparks. Rivets bursting from the tank was comparable to coming under attack from machine gun fire, while buildings, boats, and people were tossed about like the toys of a two-year-old throwing a tantrum. In a matter of just a few minutes, the entire waterfront area was destroyed beyond any recognition. Soon the neighborhood was filled with members of the Boston police, Red Cross workers, and sailors and soldiers who were in the area. A temporary hospital was quickly erected at Haymarket, where volunteers treated the victims of the bizarre disaster. When the Suffolk County Medical Examiner arrived on the scene, several dead bodies had already been pulled out from the molasses, and he remarked that the corpses looked like they were covered in heavy oil skins. Given its sticky nature, it didn't take long for rescue workers to become caked in molasses. As the Boston Post reported, The whole hospital reeked of molasses. It was on the floors, on the walls. The nurses were covered with it, even in their hair. To add to the horror, Boston cops were forced to shoot severely injured horses in the decimated city stables. Rescue efforts continued for days. The nightmarish specter of cadavers covered in thick brown goo was the reward for those bravely searching for survivors. As you might imagine, the molasses made finding the bodies extremely difficult, and it was four months before all of those killed were recovered from the mess. As the molasses hardened, saws and broom handles were used to break it up. The water in Boston Harbor remained a murky brown color until that summer. People unintentionally tracked the gross goo from the north end all over the city on their shoes and clothes, rendering the entire city city of Boston a sticky, disgusting mess. There was nowhere in town that you could hide from the cloying, sickening smell of molasses. In the aftermath, 119 individual lawsuits were filed against United States Industrial Alcohol USIA, by August of 1920. Due to the complex nature of the case, not to mention the large number of plaintiffs and lawyers, Judge Laurinus Eaton Hitchcock, the Superior Court judge, consolidated the lawsuits. Each opposing side had one lead attorney and an auditor, Boston attorney Hugh W. Ogden, was appointed to hear the evidence and subsequently issue a report pertaining to liability and damages incurred. In a nutshell, Chief Judge of Boston Municipal Court Wilfred Bolster and MIT Professor C.M. Stoffart concluded that structural issues with the tank itself were to blame for the accident, while USIA maintained that the tank had been sabotaged by Italian anarchists. On April 28, 1925, Ogden finally handed down his verdict, concluding that USIA was at fault. Ogden stated, The general impression of the erection and maintenance of the tank is that of an urgent job. I believe and find that the high primary stresses, the low factor of safety and the secondary stresses in combination were responsible for the failure of the tank. 
And thus ended the longest and most costly civil suit that Massachusetts had ever seen. As a direct result of this disaster, the city of Boston began the practice of requiring that all plans for construction projects must be approved by an engineer or an architect prior to any work commencing. Before long, this practice spread throughout the entire country. The tank that caused all the trouble was never replaced or rebuilt. The site is now home to a recreational center that includes a baseball field and a playground. Bocce courts are also present, a nod to the neighborhood's still vibrant Italian community. The only reminder of the day Boston drowned in molasses is a discreet plaque commemorating the tragedy near the park's entrance. Now for a bonus fact. Speaking of disasters, while everybody knows about the Titanic sinking and the number of human lives lost, an oft-forgotten part of the tale is the loss of those with tails, specifically the dogs aboard the Titanic, with only three dogs ultimately surviving. How were these three dogs saved in lifeboats when there wasn't enough room for all the human passengers? Well, the dogs were tiny, comprising two Pomeranians and a Pekingese, so seemingly nobody complains. One little Pomeranian was named Lady and was bought by Titanic passenger Miss Margaret Hayes in Paris. When the order was given to evacuate, Lady was wrapped in a blanket and carried onto a lifeboat by Hayes. The fabulously wealthy family, the Rothschilds, owned the other Pomeranian that survived. The Pekingese, named Sun Yat-sen, was brought on board by the Harper family of the New York publishing firm Harpers & Row. As you might be deducing from these names, only first-class passengers had dogs aboard. Moving on to the dogs that weren't so lucky, William Carter was traveling with his wife Lucille and two children, along with a King Charles Spaniel and an Airedale. Naturally, the children begged to take the dogs when evacuating, but Carter insisted that they were too big and assured his distraught children that the dogs would be fine in the ship's kennel. This was most certainly a lie. Interestingly, the parents had the foresight to have the dogs' lives insured for some reason, and between the two insured dogs, they got about $300 or about $7,000 today. As for the other dogs aboard, most of their names aren't known, with the exceptions of that owned by world-famous millionaire John Jacob Astor's Airedale Kitty. A woman named Helen Bishop also brought a fox terrier named Dog. Passenger Robert Daniel brought Gemin de Pycombe, his French bulldog. Then there was the Great Dane owned by 50-year-old Elizabeth Isham. Miss Isham visited her dog on the ship's kennel daily. When the ship was evacuating, she asked to take the dog with her. When she was told the dog was too large, she refused to leave the ship without him and got out of her lifeboat. Several days later, the body of an elderly woman clutching a large dog was spotted by the recovery ship Mahe Bennett. Dinghies were dispatched to round up the bodies of the woman and the animal. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel called Highlight History? I'm going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.